afternoon and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series, our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programs to provide you and your team timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events here at NCIA, and as always, I'm very excited to welcome you all to another stellar edition of our Committee Insight Series today being presented by NCIA's Human Resources Committee. Now, let's get this show on the road. Human Resources is the hub of the workplace, the employee experience, and leadership decisions, with the cannabis industry being no different. So in today's program, our panel of HR experts will equip you with the tools needed to create a healthy workplace, a positive employee experience, and an effective relationship with your leadership team to make the right decision for your cannabis company's success. Sit back and settle in as they walk you through you and your team through a number of strategies for creating an influencing change with other strategic leaders across the organization by effectively utilizing data. Well, I know our panel is eager to dive into today's discussion and our audience is interested in having all their questions answered along the way. So let's not waste any more time. Kick things off, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's session, Shawnee Williams, the founder of Illinois Equity Staffing, to the virtual stage to kick things off by introducing our panel of cannabis human resource experts. Welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials, everyone. Great to see you all today. You all can activate your video feed and take Shawnee's direction from here and dive into today's program. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. My name is Shawnee Williams. As Brian mentioned, I am the founder of Illinois Equity Staffing and I will be your moderator for today's session. Along with me, I have two of our HR committee members, Nicole um, from Urban Grow. She's actually newly promoted, so I'm gonna let her introduce herself, as well as Dan Walter from Future Sense. Do you guys wanna chime in? Sure, thank you so much, uh, Shawnee. I'm Nicole McIntyre. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources for Urban Grow. I've been with the company a little over three and a half years, and we are actually a complete turnkey solution in agriculture. I've been in HR a little over uh, 23 years. I'm aging myself there, um, but I'm happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you. And I'm Dan Walter. I'm a managing consultant at FutureSense. We do all sorts of HR, human capital consulting, but my focus is in the compensation space. Uh, and I've helped many cannabis companies in constructing their both pay structures and incentive plans. And um, this is a space I, I work with a lot of companies that are outside of cannabis as well and high growth startups. And for me, this is uh, one of the more interesting industries I work in. So, Awesome. Thank you both. Now, to get started, we're actually going to be talking about the toxic workplace. But before we get started, we want to talk about why we actually decided to talk specifically about toxic workplace and employee experience and um, data analysis. So by now, we've all heard about the great resignation taking place across the U.S. If you have not, you're probably one of the lucky ones. Um, many folks are surprised about this, but some of us saw this coming several months ago. Um, so if you don't know, the great resignation basically is this huge um, population of Americans who are leaving their workplaces in droves. Um, and we want to really talk to you guys about how you can strategically make a difference in your cannabis business to avoid the great resignation affecting you guys. Now, toxic workplace, what is it? A toxic workplace is anything that causes dissatisfaction or discord within a team of employees. Unfriendly colleagues, we all had them, abusive bosses, poor workspace. Um, those are just a few examples of what we consider toxic workplace environments. Typically in a toxic work environment, employees feel they cannot be their true selves. They can't bring their whole selves to work. Um, they feel they're not being heard, whether it be by their coworkers or their actual supervisors and managers. Um, and they feel like they can't be honest with their direct supervisors or they even face some type of harassment or discrimination in worst cases. So how do you guys know just from a high level overview that you actually have a toxic workplace or a toxic environment on your hands in your organization. Well, high turnover is a huge sign of toxic workplace environments. 
If you're constantly in a state of feverishly interviewing candidates to replace old employees, you may have a toxic workplace environment. Obviously, exception to the rule would be if your organization is growing extremely fast. Communication, whether written or spoken, is usually on the rocks in toxic workplaces. And what do I mean by that? Well, we're talking lack of clear direction on projects or responsibilities, failure to listen on both sides, so employee side and supervisor side. Another huge sign of bad communication is constant off hours communication, whether it be text, phone calls, emails, it's the worst. No one wants to get a text message from their supervisor on a Sunday or you know, a Wednesday night at 11 p.m. That should not be the norm in your organization. Employees need time to unplug and leave work at the office. A quick fix for those of you who like to get work done late at night, which there are a lot of people who are like that, schedule your correspondence and your communication to happen 9 a.m. the next day, okay? Another sign of toxic workplaces are lack of leadership or subpar leadership. We've all heard... Most people usually end up quitting their jobs because of their direct supervisors. That's a proven fact. That could be a micromanager, a boss that has no respect, a boss that doesn't take accountability for their own actions, a boss that is never around. Um, and really your workplace environment trickles down from the top leadership all the way down to your most entry-level employees. Employee burnout is another sign of toxic workplaces. You'll know if you have employee burnout if you begin to see a spike in call-ins. This could be from employees who literally are so burnt out that they are physically sick or employees who just don't want to deal with the mental or emotional drain that work takes a toll on them through. Now, work-life balance often is difficult to articulate, <clears throat> but it goes with this whole toxic workplace conversation. It's a great indication that you may have a toxic environment on your hands. So unplanned overtime, um, comments from leadership, whether joking or not, about taking earned vacation, that all funnels into the work-life balance conversation. Diversity, equity, inclusion. Everybody wants to talk about social equity in the cannabis industry, um, yet no one wants to really put in the work to internally actually affect change within their internal organization. It's tough, I get it, it really is. But if your employees who belong to marginalized groups feel they don't belong day in and day out in your organization, you've got a problem with diversity and equity and inclusion. Female employees that don't see women in their leadership team, that's a problem. Um, no employee resource groups for employees to lean on, that's another problem. So um, those are just a few signs that you have a problem with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Lastly, loss in productivity and revenue. If you're seeing a loss in productivity, if you're seeing a loss in revenue or a decrease, it may sound cheeky, but unhappy employees make unhappy customers and unhappy customers obviously result in lower revenue. The moment your employees experience loss in productivity, you need to immediately try to understand why, unless you plan to go out of business, that is. Next, I'm going to throw it over to Nicole to talk about the employee experience. Thank you so much, Shawnee. I appreciate that. <clears throat> so COVID has certainly been a radical change uh, in all of our lives. I think a lot of us are living unlike we ever thought we would be and working unlike we thought we would be as well. And as Shawnee talked about earlier, um, the employment landscape has shifted. It is now an employee driven market. Employees are demanding what they want from employers and they're getting it. And if they don't get it, they'll move on to the next employer who will give them the things that they need um, in order to thrive in the workplace. So just as COVID's been that radical change in our lives, we as HR professionals, we need to be the radical change and fight for the radical change inside of our own organizations as well. Um, we have to pivot, we have to better the employee experience in the workplace. So creating great workplaces through an innovative and forward thinking lens is critical to attracting and retaining uh, talent in today's market. Employees want flexibility, they want purpose in their work, and they want to see growth 
potential and their future path at the at your company. Um, people have grown weary of being pushed around and feeling like they are controlled um, and feeling like you have to be this way to fit into our workplace. They've just, they're tired. They want to be led. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. So of course, HR professionals are absolutely at the helm of cultivating winning cultures where employees and leaders can thrive. Just as our plants need the water, they need light, they need nutrients, they need a nurturing environment for growth. People as living beings, we need the same things. We need those optimum conditions um, in the culture of the workplace in order for them to grow and thrive and yield the most for their organizations and themselves. They're in it for themselves and their companies. Like we can't forget the individual person. So ingredients for cultivating this type of a culture um, come down to some basic things, um, developing empathetic leaders within your culture and more servant leadership and shifting to that um, versus the do it because I told you so and don't ask why. Um, also, providing employee enrichment and employee development and embracing diversity and also creating efficient processes for them <laughs> to work in. Um, don't create processes that don't make sense and for God's sake, get out of their way. When they're doing their jobs, let them do their jobs. So creating empathetic leadership, it all starts at the top. Um, you have got to take the time to develop empath empathetic leaders within your organization. Um, when you do this, empathy in leadership and culture definitely leads to better business outcomes. I've experienced this multiple times myself in a couple different organizations. Um, HR should absolutely be engaging their leaders and developing the empathy and the soft skills, which I heard um, referred to as power skills. Um, nobody wants to call them soft skills anymore because that thinks uh, th they start thinking that makes you soft, which is not the case at all. When you employ those um, soft skills in your communi communication, those are really power skills. Um, start using those power skills with your employees um, and your teams and your leadership. Coaching and mentoring are also very useful techniques in creating a culture of empathy. And then I talked about servant leadership. I mentioned that um, a minute ago. You know, one of the things that it doesn't matter what role you're in, um, I'm here to help the employees. I'm here to help the leaders. I'm here to help the company. I'm here to serve all of those sectors of my workforce. So it's always, how can I help? What can I do for you? Um, you know, I want to provide that support for leadership and provide that support for employees without removing um, the responsibility. What direction do you wanna grow in? Um, empathy is actually something that can be learned as well. It's not something that you have to be born with. Um, just as with any skill, though, if it doesn't come naturally to some of your leaders, um, it really can be taught as, as long as they want to learn it and as long as they also practice the skill. Um, takes Taking something from the seven habits of highly effective people, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Try looking at things from other people's um, perspective. Once you hear them out, um, they feel like they've been heard and then they will in turn listen to you as well and you'll get a better dialogue that way. Also, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Um, Brene Brown talks a lot about uh, vulnerability in leadership and how effective it can be as a skill, especially in developing trust and empathy. Don't be afraid to share some of your stories, some of your failures, some of your experiences, because then employees know it's okay to make mistakes. Like we are all human. I know I've made mistakes and I don't wanna create a culture where people are afraid of making mistakes. Um, then you get a lot less trust in the workplace and you get 
uh, less innovation and creativity as well. So it's okay to be vulnerable with your employees and talk about your own experiences as well. And then they're more likely to also share theirs with you. So it's very important. All of us have bias. It just is a fact. I mean, whether it's conscious or unconscious bias, we all have them. So just trying to be aware of what your bias, biases are um, so that you can work through them or work past them. Uh, also engaging in creative solutions. I mean, women have been uh, affected by this pandemic uh, so much more than a lot of people even know if you don't have uh, children who have been in school or not in school because of the pandemic and what kind of creative solutions can you um, employ for those employees who might need a little more help right now and you know maybe they've got a kid virtual school um, and they need to attend to that and the other work assignments can possibly wait you know until a little bit later in the day so what kind of creative schedules flexibility um, engage your employees in what would work for them like what is it that you need so that you feel you have the support in the workplace to be as effective as you can possibly be this is a trying time for all of us so let's not forget that our employees need help so when leaders in the organization display empathy, it's it starts getting built into the culture and it is then built into the culture. This contributes to building trust, like I mentioned before. It also um, absolutely increases effective communication and collaboration in the workplace as well and encourages uh, cooperation amongst teams as well within the organization. When you've got all of your leaders displaying empathy and servant leadership, and we're all on the same page with how employees are treated within the organization as human beings, um, definitely leads to better business outcomes and more collaboration. Leads to positive results. Um, also, when it comes to employee relations and conflict, I mean, nobody likes dealing <laughs> with conflict and employee relations, and typically that falls in HR's lap and our leaders as well. So when you are building trust along the way, um, one of the things I like to do, honestly, I really strive for employees to see me more for good things than they ever have to see me for something negative. That way, when something comes up, a conflict, they know it's not Nicole. They know this isn't a personal, uh, how Nicole feels about me. This is, we've got to talk about a problem, not the person. Focusing on that problem and resolving that. Um, once you build those trusting relationships and you act with empathy toward employees, uh, those employee relation issues that can be tough to deal with, they suddenly become a bit easier to swallow for all of us. So providing employee enrichment is another big piece of this puzzle. Employees really want a workplace where continued growth and opportunities are really woven into the fabric of their company culture. There are a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money either. Um, I have provided actually a lot of different opportunities. When I first joined Urban Growth three and a half years ago, um, I started a couple of cross-functional committees to focus on um, one of them we call the Educulture Committee, and we focus on educational opportunities and development for employees. We also focus on uh, culture and camaraderie building events. Um, we also focus on the community and giving back and what kind of charity drives can we do all the sandwiches or all the employees in the, you know, making sandwiches to take down to the Denver um, rescue mission, along with like clean kits and things that we had donated. So those meaningful experience and that cross collaboration in your company um, really helps employees they want to stay, they're, they're helping to create that culture that they want to be a part of. Um, so I actually led, I, the other committee that I uh, created was environmental health and safety, where we focus on, of course, safety at Urban Grow and the environment as well um, as uh, our health, our individual health as well. Um, so those committees are cross-functional employees 
And the first year I led them just to get them going. And then we uh, just similar to the NCIA committee, we kind of held, uh, you know, who wants to lead this committee for next year. So these are actually employee led committees, they meet an hour once a month, um, and they make a lot of great progress um, and engage the employees in the company and the culture as well. So a couple of things that you can do with that as well as ensure that that group has the support from top leadership. Um, the committee might even want to have a, a leader or sponsor at each of their meetings so that they see that leadership really does think it's important and they also want to engage in part of that culture building as well. <clears throat> Employees, just like myself, um, I always tell my CEO, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of a great success story. Um, and that's what employees want. They want to feel like what they are doing is giving back to the community. It's they're seeing their future there. They're seeing their own um, development there. They want to be part of a great success story. Any of those sports teams movies, what is that? Oh, the team is down. The team is struggling, but at the end, it's crazy. They have this huge comeback and touchdowns and ah, like that's what employees want. They want to feel good about their workplace and they want to feel like their company is successful and moving in the direction that they themselves see for their career as well. <clears throat> employees also want and deserve feedback. Yes, even the introverts, <laughs> even the people that don't want to talk so much about themselves or work or anything. And they say, I'm fine. Everything's going well. Make sure that you're giving them the feedback that they deserve. Um, another best practice that I use is I collect, I keep a file all year long on emails that I'm sent, or um, I keep track of projects that my employees are working on. And I give them that feedback at their one-on-ones. We have regular one-on-ones weekly where we talk about what's going on, what are some roadblocks, how can I um, manage and cut down those roadblocks for you? Where do you see yourself at this company? What development do you need? Um, really being that supportive person and then giving them feedback, whether it's positive feedback or sometimes constructive feedback for improvement. If you keep the ongoing dialogue going throughout the year, employees deserve that. And a performance evaluation that comes once a year should never come as a surprise. Employees should absolutely always know how they're viewed in their manager's eyes, in the eyes of HR, in the eyes of leadership, in the eyes of their peers. Um, it should be very clear. Um, talking around gray areas and things like that doesn't benefit anybody. There's a way to put things and say things and hold people accountable um, without being cruel um, and overly critical. You definitely want people feeling good about the feedback that they received, even if it is difficult to hear sometimes. Um, I think that you get a lot more respect as well from your employees when you are able to just be transparent with them and let them know these are all the things that are going great. And here's one area that I think you could use a little more help in. How can I help you in this area? So also it's amazing how, uh, how long a, a far a simple thank you can go even in the company letter, providing that recognition for employees, whether it's thanking them, whether it's a gift card, whether it's a shout out in the um, company newsletter, they deserve recognition as well. Let's talk about embracing diversity. Shawnee, uh, you mentioned that as well. Uh, people are just tired of wearing masks, like <laughs> more than just when it comes to COVID, people are tying, tired of uh, wearing masks. They want to bring the, their authentic selves uh, to work. They desire more transparency and acceptance in the workforce. It's time to stop expecting employees to just fit the mold. Um, find out where their strengths are. Everybody has strengths and play to your strengths. And if you are hiring a diverse uh, workforce, 
then you're probably pretty well set up that you've got a lot of different strengths in the company. So if you have an employee that is super strong in one area and they could use some help in another, find someone else who loves doing that and that's their strength as well. Um, develop more collaborative type of processes amongst employees where you can, people have a chance to show off their strengths. Like who doesn't love being able to show off what they're good at? And they are typically more passionate about engaging in things that they're really good at as well. Creates more of that happiness in their role. So it's also important to provide flexibility um, and just meet people where they live. This contributes to building loyalty and also engagement. Kind of what I was going back to about the working moms, like meet them where they live. What kind of flexibility do they need? This is still a turbulent time that we're living in. Um, and it's very important for employees to see that they are supported by their leaders and HR and the C-suite by their peers. So I'm going to kind of go over the definitions. We touched on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is very important to embrace these things. Diversity in the employment context is defined as the collective mixture of differences and similarities that includes, for example, individual and organizational characteristics, different values, beliefs, experiences, backgrounds, preferences, behaviors. And then equity in the workplace refers to fair treatment in access, opportunity, and advancement for all individuals. This is actually something I've heard um, quite a bit lately in some survey data, um, is that individuals feel, especially if they're working remote, that they may not still have those promotional opportunities or networking opportunities. So if you still have a largely remote workforce, I would encourage um, Make sure you're promoting from within. Make sure you're advertising um, and have an internal application process. So, you know, you never know who's going to be interested in moving up, even in a different area in your company. So it's important we're doing these kind of things to ensure everyone in the workplace has the same opportunity um, for advancement, for growth, for different roles in the organization. Excuse me. Uh, inclusion in the workplace describes the extent to which each person in the organization feels welcomed, respected, supported, and considered valuable to the team, um, and making that very evident uh, to individuals. So, how is the onboarding process? Um, I know that we have a very uh, cross-functional onboarding process at Urban Grow, where we're introducing all of the employees to all of the different import uh, departments so that they can kind of, you know, meet their coworkers, even though we are start, still uh, largely remote, people are able to meet the different teams and find out what the different departments in their organization do. Um, these types of things are invaluable when you're bringing new employees into the organization to get them up to speed as quickly as possible, and so that they also already start feeling a part of this new company that they've joined. So a strategic diversity, equity, and inclusion management plan can help an organization make the most of its diversity uh, by creating an inclusive, equitable, and sustainable culture and work environment. This absolutely will help with retention and attraction efforts um, of employees. All right, creating efficiency. Uh, performance management uh, is definitely difficult. I, I always tell my leadership that uh, being a leader is one of the hardest jobs uh, that there is, but performance management isn't as hard as some people may think it is, uh, as long as you train leaders in some basic components for success. Ensure that your employees know exactly what's expected in terms of behavior, job performance, and what success looks like. From day one, leadership should be communicating clear expectations uh, to their employees so that there is no question of, here's my job, here's what I need to do, here's where I go or who I go to if I, if I have questions. Um, 
providing support in the way of additional training or resources to employees um, that may also need to like setting the goals and then providing support for the employees to achieve those goals, whether that's uh, stretch assignments or a class or mentoring and coaching with other employees who may have that expertise and create logical, efficient processes that aren't hindered by a lot of red tape and unnecessary approvals. I've seen this a lot in some of the larger organizations um, that I've worked for, like, ah, oh, it takes like 10 approvals just to hire someone, and then it's taking two weeks to get through the system. So, you know, do what logically makes sense. And, you know, we all want to hit that easy button, right? So create those processes that are very efficient for employees that don't create roadblocks for employees. It's also important that we are not roadblocks either. Um, we want to make sure that we let our employees thrive and we're not micromanaging them and we let them know we're here to help them uh, if that time comes. But, you know, checking in with them to see how they're doing. Um, not, not every hour. <laughs> Refrain from the urge to do that. But by exercising some of that trust and patience with your employees, um, I think you'll absolutely see them uh, thrive, especially if they're not bogged down by a lot of approvals uh, red tape, if they're not as afraid to make decisions because their manager might come down on them, um, that can cause paralyzation absolutely in employees that they're just terrified to make any decision if something has gone wrong. So it's really creating that uh, safe space for people to make mistakes and then how we learn from those mistakes. If you're making the same mistake over and over and over again, okay, that's performance management and we're gonna have to talk about that and we're gonna have to deal with it. But for one-off mistakes that happen, that's going to happen. We're all human. So try to create that safe space and efficient process where employees can really thrive in their jobs. Another piece of this is engaging employees in process development and SOP development. Uh, like I said a, a few minutes ago, everybody likes to show off their skills and show off what they can do and how well they can do something. So by engaging them in creating processes and SOPs, um, you actually get better buy-in for those processes and uh, better adoption also throughout the organization. When, when we know that these, these processes are being created at the ground floor and at the employee level. Nobody knows the jobs better than the employees. They are the closest to them than anyone else. So engage them in creating those efficient processes. Also, it's important to address performance um, or communication issues on the team in a timely manner. It's absolutely crucial in performance management. When teams uh, think that someone else is getting away with something, um, some lack of performance and things like that, that actually uh, de-engages, demotivates your employees if they see that one person on the team is perceived as a favorite, um, or they're not held accountable to deadlines like the rest of us um, getting their work done. Uh, employees need to see action. Just saying, oh, I, I hold my people accountable. Like that's not enough. You need to actually be holding people accountable for results, for their performance. Uh, actions speak a lot louder than words. When employees see that accountability at the organization and efficiency and efficient processes are all valued, they will definitely be more engaged and productive. All right, so what did we talk about when it comes to great employee experiences and creating uh, winning work cultures? HR needs to be the change agent. We just do. <laughs> That's kind of our role in the company is to lead the way and, and um, advise and guide leaders, uh, whether they're C-suite or whether they're manager levels or whether they're leads on the production floor. Um, we have to be that change agent uh, that leads a charge in cultivating winning cultures. Uh, when we invest in leadership and we invest in employee development, as well as embracing diversity and continuous process improvement, all of those things provide the right nutrients to maximize growth at your organization. So you'll want to plant the seeds today that are going to yield you maximum results for growth tomorrow.
All right, Shani, I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Cole. Next we have Dan. Dan is actually going to talk a little bit more about how you use the data and the analysis to actually get what you need from the other leaders in your organization um, to be a strategic HR partner. Dan, take it away. Thank you very much. I'll try not to bring this whole thing to a train wreck after that great first two thirds of the presentation. Um, so really when we're talking about data winning the day, the most important thing and, and some people at the beginning of this had answered that sort of icebreaker with you know data and analytics is maybe the most challenging piece of HR. So let's talk a little bit about what that actually means. So the most important person at your company, and they will normally tell you this, is your CEO. If you're not sure if they're the most important person, ask them. They will tell you they aren't by making it clear how they are. Um, but the, the key here is you need to know how to talk to your CEO. And the way you know how to talk to your CEO is knowing what they want. Here's what they want. They want to know that you understand the company's strategy. They want to make sure that their customers are taken care of, whoever the customer is defined as at your firm. They need to know, especially if you are a pre-IPO company, that you are keeping their investors pleased. And they need to know that they have the culture that will get them to a finish line. Anything you do in the HR department has to be aligned around at least three of these things. If you don't know what these things are, it's a crazy thing. You can actually ask your CEO. They will very explicitly lay these things out for you. Sit down and say, hey, I just need to make sure I'm interpreting what the business strategy is. But I don't want to do that. Tell me what our business strategy is now for the next three years, for the next 10 years. Don't guess. They will, whether they've ever said it out loud before, they will say it out loud for you. When you ask how important your customers are and which customers are important, they will tell you. So if you sit down and find out what these things are, everything you can do is discussing the solutions you bring from the CEO side of the table. Hey, so we're doing this because it's great for our culture, it's great for our customers, and it's great for our strategy. Hey, we're doing this instead of that because our investors are going to support this. And as it turns out, when our investors support that, we'll have a little more money over here to deal with our customers. And this is a big piece of our culture. It's a crazy thing that when you speak in those terms to a CEO, they usually are going to listen to you. So start with something they don't know. So when you sit down with any program, there is about 42,000 things an HR pro knows that a CEO believes they know, but they don't know. And what a lot of HR people, people try to do is they sit down and they go, <laughs> there's 475 things for you and your ceo goes seriously what am i going to do with 475 things um start with the end oftentimes when we put together presentations we do it the way we want to teach something we sit there and go okay here's methodical here's step one here's step two here's step three here's step four the one thing you need to understand about your CEO is one, they don't have very much time. Two, they're smart, almost exclusively they're smart. And they will get to your answer faster than you can get to your answer. So instead, start with the answer. If you've ever read the Harvard Business Review, every article starts with an executive summary, which by the way, people write whole articles just having read the executive summary. So start with, we're trying to do the following to do the following. This is gonna cost us $42 because it's this benefit plan is a better benefit plan than this plan. So I think we're gonna choose it. 
then you can say, here's how I got there. Here's the people I talked to. Here's what we did. But start with the answer. The answer is X. Speak their language. And it's funny that you say this, that you have to say this, because as HR people, we like to talk in HR terms. But when you talk to your staff, you need to speak to them in their terminology. And this is a lot of times where, you know, consultants don't resonate with your staff because you've come up with a shorthand for things that are important to your company. And a consultant comes in and they just sort of talk around those things, but they don't really get what makes your company your company. The same is true with your CEO. They don't want to hear about whatever HR term of the week is or term. They want to hear about the things they care about. So one thing you can do, listen in on investor calls. If you're a public company, absolutely do that. Ask if you're a private company, if you can see the most recent deck that the executive team has given to, exec to the investors. Find out what they're talking about. Find out what's important to them. And whatever you're doing, make it aligned to what they're talking to other either executives or your investor about. It's a crazy thing. If you can make this seem like their idea, it will become their idea. If you're like, well, come on, you know, I read this book from so-and-so and then I watched this SHRM video and then I went on LinkedIn and they had this training program on better talent acquisition. They're like, ah, can we hire people faster? Yes. Is it cheaper? Yes. Is it more efficient? Yes. Does it make more sense? Yes. Are the investors going to be happier? Yes. Good. Then do it. Like, oh, wow. Seriously? Yeah. And it's funny because you'll see people shaking their heads, but this is critical. You need to speak their language. If you don't know what EBITDA means, learn what EBITDA means. If you don't know the difference between earnings and revenue, go learn what the difference is between earnings and revenue. If you don't know what TAM and SAM are, and I'm not going to tell you, go look up what TAM and SAM are. You need to understand this terminology so when you're speaking to them, it resonates with them. And then anything you say will resonate with them. So this is a really frustrating piece for me. Uh, I speak to HR leaders on a regular basis and I ask them, hey, what is your business strategy? So what is it and how does it apply to you? And every HR leader has an answer to that question. And 80% of the HR leaders are wrong. Frustrating. You make assumptions that either because you worked at another company that had X, Y, or Z, that that must be the same reason you have it here. Or you make an assumption that because you're trying to do the following thing, that everybody else at the company cares about that thing. Oftentimes, we're trying to make it a friendlier, greater place to work. And your CEO is like, all I want is more productivity. More. Give me more. But it needs to be friendly. Say, we're going to make the business more productive by making it a friendlier place to work. Just changing the wording around, all of a sudden, we'll get to buy-in. But don't guess. Don't don't wonder what is it we're trying to accomplish. The amazing part is how many HR people, when I say, what are you trying to accomplish over the next three years? Give me an answer that has nothing to do with the company's actual strategic business plan. It's out there. All you have to do is ask. If you're an HR leader and you ask, your executive team will tell you what the strategic business plan is. You don't have to guess. And then everything is about making the company more successful, which seems obvious. And everybody in HR is, well, we are trying to make the company more successful. But start with, how does your CEO define success? I once had a CEO said, I said, 
tell me what successful is. And he goes, all right, honest to God truth. It's me sitting in this office. We were in New York City. It's me sitting in this office, smoking a cigarette, money coming out of the air conditioning vents. The rest of the floor is empty. Oh, wait, no staff, tons of money. You just smoking a cigarette, nobody bugging you. And he goes, yeah. He goes, how close can you get to that? Now, can you get close to that? No. But when that's the definition, everything you communicate is about getting closer to that. It's closer to the moment where they're sitting, having money, or they're on a beach, or they're making, or they've delivered the best product in the history of mankind, or they've made everybody out of, CEO recently say, well, I want everybody at the company to be a millionaire. I went, that's great. Your company has $18 million in revenue and you have 82 employees. You don't have enough revenue to make everybody a millionaire if you gave them all the money your company brings in. It's physically impossible. So let's talk about a realistic expectation or how are you going to make yourself worth enough millions to pay everybody a million dollars? Oh, now, is that an HR or a compensation solution? No, but can you deliver an HR compensation solution on that if you don't sort of call out the elephant in the room? No. So everything has to be about we're, this is how we get to your goal for what the company needs to be. Not what your goal is for HR, what your goal is to make something a better place or this cool thing you've always wanted to do or fix that one department that's broken. You might find that department that's broken. They don't care less if it gets fixed right now. If you get these other six departments working just a little bit better, then you can have all year to fix that other department. If you get these other six departments working, and go fix the broken one next month. Even though it seems like a priority and everybody's screaming over there, right now, they're not part of the solution. They're just part of the noise. I gotta get this piece done. Which takes us to your CFO, the king or queen or Z or Zem or whatever of data. Um, you, if you're going to speak to your CFO intelligently, you need to understand the economy as it relates to your business. So you are in the cannabis industry, but you may not be in the vertical market. You may be in the cultivation market. You might be in distribution. You might, whatever you're in, if you're in distribution, you need to understand the 3PL marketplace more than you need to understand cannabis. If you are in specific states, you need to understand what's happening economically in those states more than you understand the sort of general, this is what's happening nationally because this is such a state-driven industry right now. You need to understand what kinds of growth strategies do other companies use or have other companies been successful with in cannabis. It's not just be bigger. Um, you need to make sure you don't, have execution errors. CFOs hate when you make math mistakes, but they don't mind if you ask math questions. So don't guess. A lot of people are sort of like embarrassed because they're an HR person and really I'm not a really mathy kind of person. So I'm just trying to figure it out. Ask, ask, oh my God, they love giving you math help. They love showing that they're smarter than you in math because they are. It's totally fine. That's their job. They should be better than you at math. Let them be that person. If you're going to figure out a way to make your staff better, you need to figure out a way to make it neutral, cost neutral every time. Now, it's not possible every single time, but that's where you start your conversation. So we tried to make this cost neutral and it's going to cost us X, but that's as low as we can make it as opposed to this is gonna cost us this much money. Could it cost less? They are, you've lost the argument at that point. You gotta play offense with the fact you know what they're going to ask you. Um, 
you need to understand the cost of retaining and keeping your top talent. So most people will tell you top talent costs 150% of their salary to replace them. I would argue in the cannabis industry, it's probably twice that between lost productivity, between getting somebody trained, between the time it takes to get a really good person actually brought in and hired, probably 3x somebody's base pay. Which means if you can keep a person an extra six months, you just saved the company tons of money. But if you just never lose people that are good, you've saved the company ridiculous amounts of money and started multiplying that. Uh, and then make your department a better finance partner. So one thing I tell people all the time when working with your CFO, and we'll walk through some of these things though, is don't give your CFO answers. Your CEO likes to have answers. Give your CEO or give your CFO models. Here's what we did. Here's how we did it. And then here's some levers you can pull on yourself. If we do this, if we do this, take some time. If you're not good at Excel, buy somebody lunch and have them help you with the Excel piece. Take some classes in Excel. It's not that hard, but give them the ability to not have to figure out where you made a mistake or where they would have done it differently. Just give it to them and say, here's the answer we gave you, but here's where you can change it for yourself. Tweak that, tweak this, if this is this. So here's all the different variables, but they're all just in the spreadsheet. I promise you, there is no CFO currently employed today who can't use Excel better than you. And if you can use your, C your Excel better than your CFO, your first job is to replace your CFO. So I'm gonna say that's probably not the case, um, but give them real numbers. Let me slide on. This is HR's perhaps worst flaw for CFOs. You oversell the potential gain. Well, if we do this, this is going to bring in 22 additional of these employees without any effort, or it's going to save us a million dollars. And it's like, no, here's the crazy part about HR. You're the most powerful department in your company because you control the largest part of revenue in your company. You control at most cannabis companies, which are human capital intensive, you control somewhere between 70 and 80% of your company's revenue, which means if you can get a 3% efficiency or a 3% gain, that's like a 12 to 20% gain for everybody else in the company. That savings is enormous everywhere else in the company. Simply reducing your turnover rate by, if you're a company with 300 people in the cannabis industry, if you reduce your senior turnover rate by three or four people a year, it materially changes the budget for marketing, cultivation, sales, R&D, materially. Just a few people. You don't have to save the world in HR. You just have to save a little bit because that little bit translates to a lot. The other piece is, is don't look and go, well, you know, I projected this and I did the math and I'm looking at this incentive plan. And if we do what my math says, then we'll be paying these people a million dollars. And the CFO goes, what was your growth rate? Well, I was just looking, I was doing easy math. So it's, you know, 20% a year. And they go, yeah, we're projecting 4% a year. So you're off by 500%. Oh, you're not off by 16%. You're off by multiples at that point. Ask, use real numbers. Um, make sure that your models are directly in line with their models. It is crazy to me how many people in HR 
guess at what somebody in finance is doing. Finance has already laid out a model for the next three years at your company. They might not have shared it with you because you never asked for it, but they have it. They have a pretty good idea of what not next year's revenue is supposed to be, but two or three years from now's revenue is supposed to be. And if you put together an incentive plan based on revenue and you're making assumptions that your revenue is going to be $500 million and they're making assumptions that your revenue is going to be $230 million, you broke something. So don't oversell. You have way more than enough volume of dollars to sell conservatively and still make great gains for the company. And then lastly, use rational charts and rational graphics. Use your spreadsheets to graph for you. Don't make a line that says, well, imagine if our stock price was at 10 and it went up to 20. It's like, no, 10 to 20 is this line right here. Why would you make the line look like this? That doesn't make any sense. Don't sort of try and prove your point with prettier graphics when it comes to your CFO. Just give them the numbers. Give them the chart as it shows up from Excel. And they'll go, oh, good, that was an increase. I was hoping for an increase. And in the end, super easy to convince your CFO because your goals and their goals are literally exactly the same goals literally the same goals. If you ever sat down over drinks and said, what are you trying to accomplish? You're going to go, oh, damn, I'm trying to accomplish the exact same thing. And there's no reason to be at odds with your CFO. If you're odds with your CFO, it's because you didn't actually have a discussion with them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, for those who were able to stay with us during the whole presentation, thank you. We now want to open it up. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. But for now, um, if you don't have questions, I actually have a few for both Dan and Nicole. Um, Dan, my question for you is what first steps would you take if you were an HR strategic partner to engage the CFO and or CEO of your company? What reports or data would you want to use? Well, when it comes to my CFO, first thing I'd say is, can I see what the capitalization table looks like? And can I see what our strategic financial business plan looks like? They will take you seriously. You might not know what they actually say. Ask, ask, and then ask again. They'll explain them to you. They'll explain every single number. They, have, they do it all the time anyways. They do it for investors. So that's where I'd start your CFO. Start with the things they work from on a daily basis. With your CEO, you really want to sit down and say, okay, where are we going? I need you to define what the mountain on the horizon is. I'll figure out the path to get there, but tell me where it is we're heading. I feel right now like I'm going aimlessly towards a thing I'm guessing at, but if I don't know where we're headed, I can't help you get us there. Make sure they know that's your secret sauce, that everything you're doing is to make them successful in what it is they're trying to do. They will support you a billion percent and you will look like the smartest HR person in the world. Love it, love it, great answer. Nicole, what types of perks or benefits do you think help an organization to attract and retain top talent? Um, I definitely think some of the, I mean, obviously there's your standard, you know, medical, dental insurance and things like that. Um, the other uh, program that I think is really important is a really solid EAP program, especially during these turbulent times that we're in and all the stress that everybody's been under. Um, a lot of EAP programs, I mean, most of them offer financial counseling, um, personal counseling, marital um, counseling, 
uh, as well as training, my EAP uh, program actually offers over 8,000 uh, training courses online, even like getting a PMP certification. They have all of the training classes within their system for employee growth and development as well. Um, we also instituted a library where we, um, you know, everybody who reads business, business books in the office or ag books or anything like that, um, once you've given them a read, uh, we like to donate those to our business library and employees can actually check out books and um, learn, you know, about leadership or agriculture. Um, so I also think that coming together and, and camaraderie uh, building events, whether it's an afternoon at, at Top Golf or a barbecue in your back parking lot, um, creating those events that tie the ethos, the emotion of people to the workplace, because those are the types of workplaces that people don't want to leave. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so lastly, we just have our contact information here in the slide that Brian just put up. Um, and Brian, I'm actually going to kick it over to you. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you, Shawnee, for moderating today's conversation and huge thanks to you both, Nicole and Dan, for joining us on today's panel as well, diving into each of your respective regions of expertise uh, and really going in depth into some of these HR topics on creating um, a great positive work experience for employees, as well as some of the nitty gritty details behind utilizing data and how to present and speak that information uh, to your all's um, executives team. So um, we'll leave you all with this end of event credit sequence highlighting the 25 plus member businesses that participated in this afternoon's session and made up our human resources committee for the current term, which just wrapped up earlier this summer. If you don't see your company included in the slideshow, don't be discouraged. That just means you need to head to thecannabisindustry.org slash join following today's session to join the movement for a responsible and equitable cannabis industry. Enjoy, and we'll hopefully see you again tomorrow for another NCIA Industry Essentials educational webinar. See you then. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live as well. We'll see you all tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much.